Welcome to this afternoon's program on Muslim militia working for innovative peace and harmony in Indonesia. The Nahdlatul Ulama, NU, is the largest Islamic organization in Indonesia, the country with the largest Muslim population. NU has long been known for its commitment to a pluralistic state and its insistence on the use of persuasion and education rather than legislation to encourage Indonesian Muslims to uphold the requirements of Islam. NU's young men's organization, Ansar, seeks to train the future leaders of NU. Ansar has a paramilitary wing, Bansar, which in recent years has protected churches and defended marginalized groups though it in the past was involved in the 1965 massacres that led to the deaths of over 500,000 alleged communists. This talk examines multiple aspects of Ansar and Bansar, including their growth into organizations that sacrifice life and limb to uphold Indonesia as a united and pluralistic state. It examines the ways in which pluralism, national unity, and the protection of minorities have become core values for NU generally and specifically for its young men's movement. The talk will also examine how this particular expression of Islam and the skills to advance it are taught to young men. We're delighted to welcome today Dr. Ronald Lukens Bull, Professor of Anthropology and Religious Studies, who's been at the University of North Carolina, I'm sorry, North Florida since 1999. Since 2015, he has been the editor-in-chief of Contemporary Islam, Dynamics of Muslim Lives, one of the first journals focused on social scientific approaches to the study of Islam and Muslims. His earlier ethnographic research has focused on Islamic education in Indonesia, starting with traditional Islamic education in the book, A Peaceful Jihad, Negotiating Modernity and Identity in Muslim Java published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2005, which examines how this community is engaging globalization through curriculum revisions. His second book on the topic, Islamic Higher Education in Indonesia, Continuity and Conflict, published by the same publisher in 2013, examines Indonesian Islamic higher education and the debate surrounding curriculum shift. This work is important in understanding counter-radical discourses within Islamic discourse. Dr. Lukens Bull received a Fulbright Research Grant 2018 to 2019 to conduct research on GP Ansor, a youth movement with militia elements associated with Nahdlatul Ulama, the largest Islamic organization in Indonesia. I wanna welcome you today, Ron, and we look forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much. All right, let me share a screen so I can share my PowerPoint. And, all right, well, good morning and, and welcome. Um, I, I see a lot of names on the participant list of people who I know and people who I haven't seen in a long time. So if you are here, it's good to interact with you again. Um, so certain things already sort of said, you know, in the introduction material doesn't need to be uh, said again, although we'd like to highlight that Indonesia is a, some people, would, some people would call it a secular state. It's not a secular state. It is a non-credal multi-religious state. You have to have a religion. It has to be a state recognized religion. Now there are six um, and the state funds, um, uh, activities in schools and officials uh, for each of the religions um, through its Ministry of Religious Affairs. So um, it's not it's not an Islamic state, but it's also not strictly a secular state. Um, not Latu Ulama um, established in 1926 for really quick shorthand on like what it is as a kind of uh, the kind of Islam, it is uh, Ashari and Kalam, Shafi'i and Madhab and Ghazalian and mysticism. So sober mysticism. Um, it is committed to Indonesia as a multicultural, multi-religious state. 
sometimes I say to, to Western audiences, I'll say pluralist, to an Indonesian audience, pluralism has become a dirty word. Um, and part of a dirty word, um, an abbreviation that's for uh, secularism, pluralism, and liberalism, which gets rendered as syphilis. Um, and so, um, and it's a dirty word because the discourse is confused between pluralism as a fact uh, and, you know, of living in a state you know, all kinds of religions are okay for living in a state versus what I might call salvific pluralism. All religions get you saved. And uh, once you've confused salvific pluralism with, you know, societal pluralism, then it's really hard to sort of have a discussion about it anymore because I, I think religious people of any religion are not going to agree with the idea that, you know, I mean, not, not everyone will disagree, but a lot of people who are religious, who are Christian, who are Muslim, who are Jewish, are not gonna believe that everybody's saved. Um, so Ansar is an autonomous unit, uh, which means the, the Enu sort of head organization advises them, but cannot sort of give direct orders. In the cultural setting, Again, these are religious leaders who are heading it. So um, what is an order and what isn't an order is maybe a technical. And then Bonser is this, and Bonser is short for a phrase, Barisan um, Ansor Surbaguna, um, which means multi-purpose, Ansor is multi-purpose brigade. Um, and in fact, there are subunits of Bonser dedicated to traffic control, um, fire and rescue, um, legal aid, um, environment and maritime issues, um, you know, uh, emergency, you know, situation, natural disaster relief. Um, first aid. Um, and I want to try to play this little march and see if we can hear it. Um, this is their march. Oh, yay, an ad. Well, there we go. So basically it says, mom and dad, give us permission to go out. We're going to go and we're going to war and we're going to defend the country and we're going to defend the religion and we're going to defend the Lama and What's the most interesting thing of this is that it is it is a complete ripoff of the Indonesian Army's march, changing out um, the references to the Indonesian flag and to the nation to you know in, uh, not the local ulama or an um and. And you, but I, it, U is you in Indonesian, and so I will call it N U whether I mean to or not. Um, and um, it is, and there's actually, I see a chapter on um, the musicology of them because they have lots of little marches and enthusiasm songs they sing and spirit songs and a lot of them are sort of directly taken from the Indonesian military. Um, and so one of the questions of, you know, why is Bonser interesting? And the little picture on the left shows what has become very common activity since about the mid 1990s. And again, recently, I'm an anthropologist, so, you know, anything in the last 10,000 years is recent. And then 
you know, last 30 years is very recent. Um, the, um, that they uh, stand guard and protect Christian churches during major holidays, including Christmas, Christmas Eve. And on the right is an image of me at, holding a picture at the 19th annual uh, memorial commemoration for Rianto, who was a member of uh, the organization who found a bomb uh, uh, outside a Christian church and, you know, lacking time or any knowledge to do anything else, he just picked it up and ran and then it exploded in his arms, killing him and wounding um, a friend. Um, this places them and Christians usually have very kind, if I tell a Christian, oh, I'm doing research on bonds, they're like, we love them. <laughs> they, they, they will come out and like put themselves in harm's way for us. We love them. Um, and so this is, I think, given stereotypes we have about Muslims, I, you know, given how Muslim militias are covered in media, uh, this is a unusual thing and something worth sort of examining. So they've, again, interested in protecting minorities and this includes churches. It is also included, uh, I misspelled mosque, but it includes uh, Shia and Ahmadiyya mosques. Uh, when Urshat Manji came and talked to in Indonesia, one of her um, book launches was attacked and the further ones were, um, and sort of responses to the attack um, that she wasn't present for, um, meaning the responses, um, were all sort of protected and, and guarded by um, uh, Bonser. Now, they do not agree with Roshad Manji on like almost every anything, but they, you know, believe in this idea of, you know, maintaining the peace and protecting. Um, and this is often in context when the police do not have the manpower or the willpower to do it themselves. Um, oftentimes in Indone Indonesia, uh, yeah, pre preventative policing does not seem to be part of like police strategy often. I don't, it, sometimes it is, I don't understand. Um, there's a lot of political dimensions of it. So, uh, and the reasons they give sort of in, Islamic terms is the idea of Islam Madani, or trying to sort of recreate the multicultural community of, May, of Medina. Uh, what they call Islam Nusantara, or Islam of the archipelago, uh, which historically, you know, until the 19th century, until Muhammadiyah started bringing kind of Wahhabi ideas in around 1912, it was dominated by Sufism and Tarakat. So we've got uh, a part of the Muslim world in which uh, a very Sufi dimension um, lasts, you know, until the 20th century as like the dominant form. And in, in Anu is as the largest organization that Sufi dimension is still the dominant form. And then you've got um, this idea of the Nagara Kasatuan Republic Indonesia, the unified state of the Republic of Indonesia as part of that, that uh, Indonesia recognizes multiple religions and so they need to be all protected. Um, when, when did these organizations start it becomes, uh, you know, do we go by when they use the names Ansar and Bonser? Because historically you've got organizations starting in the 1930s, um, Ano or Ansar Naplatu Ulama and Barisan Ansar Naplatu Ulama, uh, Ano and Bano in the 30s, um, 
and then they get sort of disbanded and then you get Hisputla, uh, Hisputla uh, in the War for Independence. But what's interesting from the 1930s through the, through the War for Independence, then emerging again in the 50s and 60s, uh, regardless of what these organizations are called, they are members of NU, the youth sort of 17, sometimes 18, nowadays it's 18, to about 45 plus or minus. Um, and, um, and sometimes uh, it was in the war for independence. And even today you get government officials who will uh, see them as auxiliary forces, uh, auxiliary forces for local police, uh, auxiliary forces for the national army. And in fact, one of the best examples of this came in 1998 when uh, during the protests against the Suharto regime and, and in the city of Jogjakarta, um, people were doing protests outside the governor's slash sultan's palace. And because people weren't happy with the Suharto regime, military was there, but in plain clothes. The uniformed personnel who were in front of the military were this militia and then some of the smaller militia from uh, Muhammadiyya, the modernist uh, sort of uh, uh, secondarily, second largest organization in Indonesia. Um, because the sense was that people would not attack the militias from these organizations, but they might attack the military. So the military was there, but not in uniform and not a visible presence. And so, I mean, they are used and seen as an auxiliary. I haven't figured out, do we talk about this as a parastate organization? Um, you know, um, now there's some interesting, when we talk about this, there's some interesting bias. Western scholars and Indonesians who are sort of Western educated, a little bit on the liberal side, want to sort of see this largely as macho vigilantism. And, you know, why not leave things to the state? And then why, why take this on? Why not leave it to the police? And of course, some of the answer of why not leave it to the police is the police are often unable or unwilling uh, to do anything. Um, you know, the, it's not uncommon in Indonesia to hear of cases where um, the police themselves are sympathetic with a more radical group, sympathetic with the Islamic Defenders Front, or sympathetic with um, Tahrir, and so they just kind of will ignore things and not let anything, you know, not do anything. Um, it is a question. And then a lot of middle-class Indonesians, again, Muslim, middle-class Muslim Indonesians, think the guys are doing it primarily for financial gain. Now, um, I can think of things that would pay much more. You know, yes, they do get pocket money, but they have to like buy their own uniforms, which are a couple hundred dollars, which on an Indonesian budget is quite a lot. Um, So one of the other questions is, is there any difference between gangsters, groups like the Islamic Defenders Front, the FPI, or Bonser, and some will say that they're the same thing. Um, up here in the upper left is a, is a picture of, of Preman, of gangsters who've been arrested. Uh, we do get a lot of former gangsters, but in both Bonser, Bonser or and in groups like the front Pembele Islam. Um, although this, uh, this corner up here, this is the front Pembele Islam and this lower corner here is what some of what they do is they go wreck shops that sell things they, that they think are haram. So um, leave you to decide whether or not that's diff different from gangsters or not. And then with Bonser, you've got these, act a lot of times it's peacekeeping activities um, and there are times when they burn other flags of other organizations, but I mean, it's not a clean 
you know, you've got sort of like, like what they want it to be. And this is the image they want it to be of, of this. And um, this is their goal of sort of a multi-religious peacekeeping uh, force. They also, um, oops, I'm losing control. Okay, previous, previous. Well, one of their biggest functions too is to, is to provide security for any new events. Um, one of the reasons why people, some people want to say, and I've had Indonesian scholars say, look, they're, they're, they're just gangsters. They're no different from Front Pembela Islam. They're no different from run-of-the-mill gangsters. And they point to 1965. And so, and while I'm not uh, uh, a scholar of 1965 and the 1965 events, um, this is not something that can be ignored. Um, so um, the, their role of it was strongest in East Java, uh, but this was done when we talk of the numbers of 500,000 or more, we're talking about throughout Indonesia uh, and there are many other militias were involved in other parts of Indonesia. If you've watched uh, Oppenheimer's films, um, you're, that's actually, um, Pamuda Panchasila youth, Pamuda Panchasila in Maidan. And the current views of these events are very um, Gustur, Abdurrahman Wahid kind of issued an apology. Of course, some people say, well, no, it wasn't an apology. It was something else. It's kind of seen as kind of an, well, it, there's debates within the organization. Was it necessary and was it evil? You know, sort of like it was a kind of a necessary evil, but like, well, was it necessary? And, you know, some say yes and some say no. And then, you know, was it evil? I think um, all would agree it's something we need to move on from. And in fact, um, in the 1990s, the leader that brought the guarding of churches also started integrating the sons of. Um, alleged communists into the NU organization and into Ansar. And when he was criticized for it, Paul Anam said, you know, the past is the past. Um, it's time to reconcile, it's time to move on. It's kind of truth and reconciliation commission without the truth part. Let's say, you know, let's not, not talk about what happened, but let's just kind of move on. Um, so today they're, like as I said, uh, in addition to sort of being multicultural, multi-religious, um, they're also very much anti-Sharia state as Anu is as a whole. You will find members of Anu or people affiliated with Anu who will take this uh, opposite position. This is just the nature of that organization. Um, officially, Anu is anti-Khalifa. Um, it is against Islamist movements um, and, you know, in favor of the rule of law, they um, support, um, they supported the banning of Hezbollah Qadir Indonesia. Uh, they support, or supported the banning of uh, the Islamic Defenders Front. Um, and in this picture down here, you see them burning um, a flag that they identified as being the flag of Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia uh, at an event that was an NU event and someone hoisted this flag. And, you know, in, in that context, it was a flag that indicated something sort of very much against sort of what NU stood for. They tore it down, they burned it. And what's interesting is out of this, um, it was decided that actually they did, they did things wrong here. Uh, that when what they didn't do is they didn't, they just acted as opposed to sort of following the chain of command and sort of um, reporting what they found and what they want to do to sort of the next level above them. This would have been like a chapter. So they should have called like the, um, the regional chapter or the state chapter, who then should have contacted the national leadership. Um, and following this event in October, 2018 and through 2019, there was 
lots and lots and lots of meetings about how, um, well, first of all, these guys were surrendered to the police for investigation and dealt with in the courts for burning the flag, burning the, uh, what some would call the Taweed flag, but they, you know, it had the, the Taweed statement on it, but it was very clearly the flag used by Hizbut Tahrir. Um, and, um, and then a very clear discussions about the need to have very clear communication up and down the command structure so that emotionally led events just wouldn't happen like this. Um, so this becomes part of the question of like, is there a difference between uh, Islamic Defenders Front and gangsters? And they say, yes, there is. Um, of course, the, the ideology, the ideology of uh, a plural uh, or a, you know, unified Indonesian state of Islam Madani, Islam Nusantara, <laughs> Um, the other thing too is I don't think that you could have something like 1965 happen again. There are no experienced fighters, just in practical terms, right? When 1965 happened, you had veterans of the 1945 to 49 war. Um, and now they're you know, they have zero experience and not a lot of training in about 5% have any kind of firearms training and probably an over, overlapping 5% have martial arts training. Um, you've got this, you know, return to a focus on religious issues in the 1980s and Asas Tungal or the idea of using the Pancha seal of the state ideology as the basis of any religious organization. Um, and starting in, in 97 or 98, depending on who you ask, um, is a very much extensive training in both sort of the ideology and the protocols of the organization and this idea of a one commander or a chain of command. Um, part of what they're also trying to do is because the young men who are involved in this are not you typically not university educated although some are in fact, one of the regional commanders has a PhD in sociology from the University of Escobansa on Malaysia. Um, they're trying to set up various activities like this travel agency uh, that will actually have branches all over um, tied to Ansor uh, so that they can arrange you know, travel for members of Matbalu Lama and then sort of provide um, entrepreneurship opportunities, entrepreneurship, part of the training weekend uh, that trains people into the militia includes several hours on the principles of entrepreneurship. Um, it's not the most interesting part, the ideologies of, you know, why we defend Christians. And those are, for me, are the interesting, the most interesting parts, the parts that sound like a Tony Robbins, you know, entrepreneurship seminar kind of bore me when I hear them, but intellectually they're a very interesting thing because that's part of what they're wanting to do is, is strengthen the economics of these young men. Um, of course, recognizing that um, economics can be a reason that draws young men into more radical groups. Um, you know, particularly if it's a well-funded radical group. Um, and then one last sort of area uh, to think about before we do question and answer is coming back to this idea of machismo. At the end of the training weekends, wh whether it's a beginning training weekend or an advanced training weekend, they have this ceremony that becomes very emotional and the men start just sobbing, or some of them do, Up about half of them are just sobbing. Now, granted, they have not slept in three days or they've slept for four hours in the last, you know, out of the last 72. Uh, they've been up all night meditating at graveyards. 
Um, they, I mean, basically they've done everything possible to set them up for a major emotional moment. And these otherwise very tough looking guys, I mean, if you meet them on the street, I mean, most of how they maintain order when they need to maintain order is just to stand there looking tough. They don't have, they don't carry weapons. I mean, some guys have knives, but they're not supposed to carry knives. They're not supposed to carry any kind of weapon, even a bamboo pole. Um, you know, so mostly it's just this intimidating glare. And here they are um, just weeping, which not only, so there's two aspects of this. It goes against the machismo idea of masculinity that people want to use to apply to this, but also because these are largely ethnic Javanese, Javanese men are, are supposed to be stoic. They're not supposed to show emotion at all. And so here we have this moment in which we've got sort of both the breakdown of the Javanese ideas of masculinity and this sort of militarized machismo masculinity. And now we've got lots of women in this um, militia that's part of the, explicitly the young men's organization. Um, and this is leading to very interesting discussions on gender um, because, well, how can they be part of something that is part of the men's group? Um, and and also why, and the why is there, there's a need, you know, like if, if some of what they do is protect and guard preachers, well, in Indonesia, um, there are a lot of women preachers. Um, they're, they're called nyai, which indicates that they're the wives of the kiai, um, but they in themselves ha have their own sort of credentials in fik, in Tasawuf and, and preaching and they, um, so they are sort of independent, uh, to use a Christianity, independent ministers of their own. Um, and if they need guarding and close bodyguarding in a very crowded Java, well, you can't have six men. When we see the, the, the guarding happening for a man, basically they're the, the six to eight men around him are in bodily contact. Well, you can't have that with a woman. So now they've got the women doing that. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to have um, gender segregated parts of a, of a lecture, then there needs to be someone on the woman's side keeping need orders and organizing the women. Um, and so, and there's debate. Is it appropriate for them to have be doing that at all? There's a need for it. Should they be wearing pants like the men? Or, and this, so there's efforts to create some sort of combat skirt um, that would actually um, pop apart and turn into like wrap around pants if you have to, if you're like really needing to move quickly, but if not, otherwise it's a skirt. Um, and then there's also, do we need to have something like this, but under the women's organization, not under the men's organization. But his, in the last several years, even the women's organization at first was like, no, we don't want anything like this. And so when you talk to these young women, well, why do you wanna do this? And they're like, well, we wanna, we wanna take action. We don't wanna just sort of the women's group likes to sit and this is them speaking the women's group likes to sit around and talk and we wanna do things. And so, you know, we're, we go out and we do things. Um, and that's, you know, again, a little overview, I think of what's going on that we can sort of explore and sort of question and answer. I think we're ready to move on to the question and answer um, part of the program. And um, Andrew, I'm going to turn that over to you. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, so we're going to be going into the Q&A. Now, if you haven't put in a question in the Q&A section, please feel free to do so. Um, we do have some stuff in the chat, though. If you do have a question, 
definitely put it into the Q&A. So the first question is from Matthew McCandles. Uh, Matthew says, thank you for the talk today. Um, he's curious if um, you would agree that the historical and cultural foundation of organized youth wings and militias in Indonesia stem from Japan's organization of militias during occupation as a tool of control and a mechanism to resist Dutch attempts to regain control of the archipelago. Um, Matthew then says there is also a tradition of uh, primanism uh, that you mentioned, which seems related, though there's a tremendously diverse uh, diversity in how groups are organized. Overall, this history seems to make uh, sub-state militias pretty ubiquitous to the country to this day. I believe his question was directed to uh, Dr. Lucas Bull. Okay, so I think there is some connection between um, youth wings and militias from the Japan's era, but let's not forget that um, the, the first sort of forms of Ansar and Bonser actually go back to like 1936. Uh, and so they like to point out that they existed as a defensive force for what became Indonesia before the Indonesian military was born. Um, and, um, and so they, pre they predate by a decade or more anything the Japanese might have done. Now, there may have been uh, an ability to um, grow during the Japanese period. It is the, um, also I think during the war for independence, these little groups were lots of different places. I think it was very much, um, Ian Wilson sort of writes about how these uh, militias were often used by uh, the Suharto regime to sort of um, direct energies in support of the regime. Um, and um, so it's not separate from those historical things that were mentioned, but I also think that some of these things sort of predate them as well. Um, you know, perhaps without them, then there, it, later there's those historical elements mentioned later, they wouldn't have sort of continued to be important. Okay, thank you so much. We do have some other questions. So this next question is from Alexandra Peltier. Alexander says, thank you so much for your talk today. What a fascinating topic. Did you observe any regional or ethnic Javanese, Mudrese, Sudanese variation in the ideological activities of the Bansir? You talked about NU and Bansir. Can you tell us more about the relations between Bansir and Kia? I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Okay, so and could you leave that up so I can have the answer for reference or the question for reference? So, um, there is some regional variation, although between the Javanese and the Madaris, not really. Um, off of the island of Java, uh, in in places like uh, you know in Kalimantan and in Sumatra, oftentimes there's these these groups are strongest amongst the ethnic Javanese. Um, the, as is Enu in general, right? Uh, but you do see um, uh, out in Papua and in Irian Barat, you've got um, you know Papuan ethnic Papuan people who've converted to Islam who then become part of. Uh, and, uh, and who become part then of Bonser, um, the the sort of popular support um, is, you know, most commonly sort of under the Javanese. Um, in Sumatra, there's there can be pushback against them um, from sort of um, non-Javanese ethnic groups. Um, in terms of the ideology, the activities, there isn't really going to be, uh, 
a difference because nowadays it, this is all sort of streamlined and centralized through training programs. And, um, you know, where there may have been room for that would have been up until about 1997 or 1998 before this happened. Um, and up until about 97 or 98, um, the relationship between Bonsar units and Ki, uh, the religious leaders, was in places a little bit more direct. I mean, basically to become a member of Bonsar prior to 1997 is a local Ki handed you a uniform and said, join. And then he sort of directly kind of directed the activities. What's happened since 97 is with the centralized training and the efforts for creating um, sort of centralizing organization and chain of command is what is that if a Kiai asks you to do something, you're supposed to not so much ask permission, but to report it up the chain of command. And so then if it if they're asking you to do something that's problematic at some point, then there's going to be an intervention backwards. And it, you know, in recent years, the young the young men who've headed the organization, who've headed Ansor, Ansor is over Bonsor, um, have been the sons and grandsons of Hiai. So, you know. It, you know, the, the one who it is now, um, he would call up and say, hey, uncle, go talk to these other Kiai. Or when I was there, he would call up and say, uncle. Now we'd call up, well, hey, this is the Minister of Religious Affairs. Knock it off. Um, because now he's, you know, um, the, the guy who's the head of Ansar, Gus Yakut, is now the Minister of Religious Affairs. So I think that there is a close relationship. Bonser is sometimes referred to as the guard dogs of the Kiai. And I think it's a complicated relationship in that they are there to guard the Kiai. They are there to do what the Kiai asks them to do. Um, but they're also so supposed to report up. So if the Kiai is asking them to do something that goes against the training, they're supposed to sort of um, let the higher ups deal with it and get them, you know, not to do it. But you know, when I keep pushing for examples, they like, well, it doesn't happen. It 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 won't happen. It doesn't happen. Okay, fine. Um, you know, um, but I think when we're looking at like the 1960s events were dealing with a much more decentralized organization taking orders directly from religious leaders. Um, Sarah's, can, Andrew, can I just, do you want to ask the questions or can I just go to the questions? Oh, if you'd like, please feel free to go to the questions. Sarah, I think you've got a really great question about extending to the LGBT community. And the answer to that is, Um, so the um, Gus Yakut has straight out said that um, the LGBT community should enjoy the full protections of the state, that their rights as Indonesian citizens should be protected by the state. Um, you know, he adds that it's a sin and but also then adds that we all sin so let's let us focus on our sins and let them focus on their sins um and you know let's not worry about their sins we've got enough of our own which i live in the deep south jacksonville florida is really part of the bible belt um i think you deal with your sins and i deal with mine as a very progressive kind of religious perspective um, you know, I'm not going to worry about yours. I've got enough of mine to deal with. Um, um, but when I ask if they would uh, 
every time they would be like, well, we'd have to knock it up to the next level to ask sort of for advice. Uh, and even when you get that to the highest levels with an onsor and then that's it to the highest level of advice means it's going to the ANU leadership and the ANU leadership will largely come and say, you know, this is a sin and we shouldn't support it. So, um, so no, Sarah, not, sadly not as much as one would hope, although there, there is this recognition that um, there is, um, a difference between you know states responsibilities and religious perspectives i john i'll have a look i don't know if there's anything on like from pop culture rappers and hip-hop now there's been movies in which they have been part of the production team to create um the the world is round um is 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 one in which they sort of try to um you know present their idea ideas in film um but you know i don't know uh there is a, a sense where i find that they are um oftentimes more respected by Christians and non-Muslims than they are by non-Anu Muslims. So Anu people love them and non-Muslims love them, but the non-Anu Muslims aren't so sure they like them. Um, Jessica, no, there is, um, so, the last example of the use of any kind of violence goes back to around 2000 and the invasion of the Java Post offices. Um, but there didn't seem to be a lot of large scale like smashing of stuff, but just sort of the occupation. Um, the the threat of violence or the readiness to use violence, I think is what they use to achieve their aims. Um, and I think there's a difference between sort of, so yeah, I guess there is a willingness to use violence, but they really haven't used it in 20 years. It's more of like, we're ready. So on May 22nd, when the Supreme Court was supposed of, of 2019 when the Supreme Court was supposed to announce the outcome of their case on the election, which they ended up announcing on the 21st. Um, I gathered with the Jakarta groups, but throughout Indonesia, uh, branches were gathered for a night of prayer and shared meals and speeches and oftentimes you in, interacting with like youth groups, youth organizations, Catholic youth organizations and other organizations present. Um, and in uniform, ready to march if called upon by um, the government. One of the things that's going on now and started sort of in, I think 2017 was a law passed that any um, civilian organization that takes on the duties of the government should be banned. So they cannot preemptively go and do any kind of crowd control. They have to wait and get an invitation from a, a government official to go and do so. Um, or else that leads them up to a calls for being disbanded. Um, and, and it's this question is like, how willing to use, and here's the thing, how prepared are they to use violence? It, you know, uh, I mean, at, at best they could be street brawlers. Um, there's no training in firearms. There's little to no training in martial arts. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's a, show of force rather than actual force 
Um, but, you know, push came to shove, yes. But I'm not sure it would be very effective. Um, let's see, given the local branches, there is the factionalism, um, but they've really, again, um, you know, since the 1990s, been stressing this idea of Satu Commando, a chain of command, and they very much, uh, you know, with the event, the, the flag burning event, really, I mean, over and over and over again, I heard, uh, you know, different places, you know, it's like this shouldn't have happened. There should have been, you know, more sort of better communication up the line. There should have been, you know, an awareness of the things that we don't do and, and don't do. Um, at every training, whether or not you, this is your third training and you're being trained to be a trainer, you're going to go through a training on this is uh, Anu ideology. This is Anu's commitment to um, multi-religious state, and this is Anu's commitment to Indonesia, this is Anu's commitment to particular understanding of Islam, this is our justification for it, you're going to be getting it, you know, so if by the time you're well, you're a trainer of trainers, you've probably gone through about four or five trainings that include this is the ideology. Um, so, um, you know, there has been some interesting research done, survey research is seeing how self-identified ANU members, how tolerant they are. And it was like, they're not that different. But the question is, is were these people who had gone through the training programs or not? Um, because, I mean, I think that matters. Um, and again, you, there may be in terms of the, uh, the factionalism, but, um, I didn't see really any issues that animate disagreement because it, it, it came, well, what does, what is the official, you know, statement of the group? Um, and, you know, you could sometimes poke at the edge and see what people would say away from the official training. Um, but um, it's not clear, you know, what that is. Um, no, I don't think there is a very good understanding of the Christian faith amongst militia members. I think they know that their faith requires them in terms of doing what the Prophet Muhammad did in Medina, in doing what NU stands for, their faith requires them to do this and they don't really need to understand um, much about the Christian faith or a lot of diversity amongst it. Um, you know, um, if a church wants bonds or protection, they would call the local branch who would then get clearance all the way up as far as they needed to, and they'd be out there. And it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, again, um, this for, for the militia members, this is about their faith, not the faith of the people that they're protecting. Um, the um, Amelia's question, um, again, I think there's going to be different opinions. Now, anytime a mayor or a police chief or a military commander is speaking at an answer or a bouncer event, of course, they are going to speak about it in the most praiseworthy of terms. Um, and in these contexts, they have come out and said that they are, you know, Ansar and Bonser are um, supplementary forces to the Indonesian forces. Um, there can be overlap. There are, um, I've met, you know, a few members who are members of the police and members of Bonser. Um, and Again, I think you'd have to get people speaking kind of way off the record to get anybody to talk about whether or not the government feels threatened by, um, specifically by Bonsor and Ansor. Um, I think anything near to on the record is 
which would including an anthropologist whose research design is to look at the organization, um, would, would, would say that they don't feel any threat. And I haven't, you know, seen any um, that Anu in general and Monster in particular were supporters of the Jokowi uh, ticket and, you know, not the immediate sort of named Minister of Religious Affairs when Jokowi first took office, um, even during his second election. But now, you know, the head of Ansar is the Minister of Religious, uh, meaning the head of Ansar was made the, the Minister of Religious Affairs. And I think I've gotten, oh, yeah, I've gotten through the questions. Well, thank you very much, Ron. Um, I'm especially delighted because uh, it's only recently, at least in, in my experience at Georgetown, only uh, in, in very recent years that uh, Indonesia begins to have, be part of our, our programming and in the, and in the curriculum. And, uh, you know, this year we have two, um, two Indonesian uh, fellows and um, we have uh, specialists uh, uh, on, on the campus that work on Indonesia and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, more development of that area. I would mention to those that are watching that the, uh, that the journal that Ron is editor-in-chief of, Contemporary Islam Dynamics of Muslim Lives, uh, is, is really excellent. Uh, in terms of the, the work that it, it has, especially since it does pull in a lot of um, specialists in Southeast Asia, uh, social scientists who, who work on uh, on Southeast Asia, uh, you know, and, and a number of uh, other top people in the field. So on behalf of the, the center uh, uh, and on behalf of the bridge within the center and on behalf of Georgetown University, thanks very much. And uh, I, I hope we'll be able to connect again in the near future. Well, thank you very much. And for anyone who's listening, um, we have actually much more budget for papers for our journal than we publish. Uh, I guess we keep the, the standard high and so we've had a decline in submissions, but, um, and even though we've had a lot on Southeast Asia, I'm looking for um, some papers on Africa. But basically anywhere in the world where there are Muslims. Um, and so I, would love to see some papers coming. Um, and now I have uh, a team of associate editors that um, are in place even to sort of coach um, papers from younger scholars, so. Great, well, thank you and uh, be in touch uh, in the next year or two.